Okay, good evening. Last week we finished chapter 4. Today we're going to start chapter 5. Uh, this is uh, Pirkei Avot series number 11 now. So Baruch Hashem 2 thirds is behind us. And we're going to start the, the fifth uh, chapter. Actually, we had one last, uh, one last thing. No, yeah, we finish it. Yeah, okay, good. So the Perik Hamishi, the fifth chapter starts. Be'asara ma'amarot nivra olam. You know when Hakadosh Baruch Hu created the world, right in the beginning in uh, Sefer Bereshit in Genesis, the first chapter, the first page. Right away we see how the story of the creation took place. What does it mean be'asara ma'amarot? Hashem said ten different things which I should say, ten things that he, that created the world. What are the ten things? So obviously, it says in the Torah, Vayomer Elohim, and Hashem says, right? So that's one time. And then it says, Bereshit bara Elohim. It's also Ma'amar. And also it says, Bidvar Hashem Shamaim Nasu, right? And uh, it also says, uh, every part that describes some kind of a creation, it's considered a ma'amar. Ma'amar mean, in Hebrew means uh, like somebody said something. It was said by someone. So all together, if you see all together, it's ten different things that HaKadosh Baruch Hu say, and that's how the world was created. That's why, that, that's why the Mishnah start, Basara ma'amarot nivra olam. So the question is, why Hashem needed to speak ten different things? He could say one thing and everything would be right away, ready, right? Why he needed to say ten different things? Uh, to put a heavier weight on a punishment of the wicked people that disobey the orders of God. If he says one order, one thing, as opposed to ten, ten, when you say ten different things, you could have said it in one minute and everything will be done. But if you say it in ten different ways and people do not listen to Hashem, it makes their punishment ten times worse. The wicked people who rebel against Hashem, Now they have bigger responsibility. Now it's a more complicated world that it was created in ten different worlds instead of one. And also to multiply the reward of the righteous people that they keep a lot more. Right? If I come, I take my little kid and I tell him ten times, I call him and I say, I want you to buy bread. Then I send him, I say, okay, come, I want you to buy milk. And he goes again, I want you to buy cheese. And I want you to buy uh, tomatoes. Ten different times, or I just tell him the whole thing in one shot. I want you to buy uh, whatever we need for that uh, salad that we're making. He already knows everything. So, ten different times is different than one time. The second Mishnah, it begins to describe all the generations in the world. Ten generations from Adam until Noah. Ten generations. Why, why the Torah has to describe that there are ten generations between Adam until Noah came to the world? Because Noah, it was the flood, right? So why, it needed to, why Hashem needed to describe it? It's to show us how much patience he had. That he waited ten generations and still did not destroy the world. Because from Adam until Noah, there were many, many people that lived for many, many years. We are talking about 1,500 years. Ten generations, but 1,500, because it was a very long generation, not like today. Today it's very short generations, but in the old days people lived hundreds of years. So that means 1,500 years were right there between Adam and Noah, and all that time Hashem waited until He decided to destroy all the wicked people. So, to show us how much patience He has, everybody got Hashem very upset and very angry until He brought the flood on them. Ten generations from Noah to Abraham, from Noah, which was finally one righteous person in the world that survived the flood, until Abraham Avinu, again ten generations. Again, ten generations were getting Hashem angry and upset until Abraham, Abraham came to the world and made Hashem pleased for finally the somebody in the creation that is righteous 
ten generations. When Avraham came, Hashem gave him reward for all the people who were prior to him. Because you saved the reputation of my word, so I'm giving you for everybody. Whatever they're supposed to get, you are going to get. But the truth is, it's a little bit deeper than that. We have a, a secret in Judaism that everybody should know. It's a very important secret. If you pay attention to it, you can earn a lot. What's the secret? The secret is that we have in the Torah a mitzvah that says, Ocheach tochiach et amitecha. We spoke about it, I'm sure you heard that before. You have to speak to your Jewish brothers and sisters to improve them spiritually, to make them more righteous, closer to Hashem. It's a very big mitzvah. If you are successful, every mitzvah they're going to do, thanks to you, thanks to your money, thanks to your house, thanks to your efforts, thanks to CDs that you gave them, you were involved in bringing them back. Every mitzvah from now on that they're going to do, they, their children, grandchildren, forever, you're going to benefit from those mitzvot. It's like you did it. It's a very good investment. You can speak to your friend one hour, you leave him, a year later you see him, he has a beer, he comes to shul, he davens, it's thanks to what you did. You spoke to him for one hour, from this moment on you benefit, you're earning, ne it's never end. For every mitzvah he does, it's hard to believe. Every Jew he saves, it's kind of like you did. And the Jew that he saved will save another Jew, that's already four different people. You continue to benefit. It's like a pyramid. However, it's not so easy to take a person and make him religious. We know that. What happens if you spend time and energy or money on a person and in the end nothing happened? He went back to his normal every day. Continue to be with Halal Shabbat. Continue to make sins. <coughs> then you may think, you know what? It doesn't pay. What? I talk to so many people. This guy does ignore it, this guy make fun, this guy laugh, this guy doesn't take it serious. Some people don't even want to listen, most people don't even want to listen. So you may think, I'm wasting my energy. What for? Well, I can be home with my wife and the children and enjoy and, you know, and, and rest. Why do I need all this headache? Begging people, come, watch it, come, there's a shiur, come to my house, listen to the lecture. The rabbi comes to give a lecture. Why do I need all this? So the answer is, and this is it, this is right here, the secret here, that every person you spoke to, and you told them enough for him to know that there's enough, you gave him enough evidence, enough reason to come closer to God, closer to Hashem, and he did not come, every Jew has a ticket to a life of eternity. This ticket is very, very precious. It's a lot more expensive than a ticket for the concert of the Rolling Stones or to the New York Knicks or to the opera or to, to fly around the world. Any kinds of tickets that you may imagine, it's a joke compared to ticket to life of eternity full of pleasure that God promised the righteous Jews. There's nothing to compare. So what's happening here, once you spoke to him and he did not do it, his share of the world to come, comes right away into your hand. So now you have two shares. And if you spoke to a hundred people over your lifetime, you get the share of every one of them to the world to come. So it's very interesting, because it's a no-lose situation. You can never lose. Even if you spoke to him and he did not do anything, and even if it was kind of obvious that he's, the chance that he's going to make one mitzvah is almost zero, just the fact you spoke to him, you already earned a huge amount without him doing anything. That's what most people don't know. Everybody knows that if you save a Jew, every mitzvah he does goes to your account. That's obvious. Everybody knows that. There's too much proofs and places that prove it from the Torah that if you save a Jew, you benefit from everything he does. Him and his children forever. But there's not that many places that indicate what I just said that you get the reward of these people, the share that they have to the world to come, because since they are losing it by not keeping mitzvot, it comes to you. Where does it say it here? Avraham Avinu, when he became 52 years old, he started to make people religious. Now we have to understand, the religion was different than today, because we didn't receive the Torah yet. And many of the things that we have today, they didn't have in those days. But the one thing is that Abraham used to go and speak to the men, and Sarah used to go and speak to the ladies, and they bring them closer to Hashem. 
One, of, one thing they told them, that there's only one God, all these idols are garbage, you have to get rid of them. And the second thing they told them, that besides the fact that there's one God, and He's watching us, and He's in charge of everything, you have to be grateful to Him. This is the foundation of Judaism, those two things. To know there's one God, and He watches everything, He's in charge of everything, that's a very important foundation. And the second thing is, to know that the purpose of this creation is that people will receive all the greatness in this world and in the next world, but the most important thing, not to be, not to be ungrateful. The word Yehudi, uh, Levi, if you can boost some air here before we faint. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> so, what does the word Yehudi mean? When you say Jew, Yehudi, what does it mean? Yehudi comes from the word Modeh. Modeh in Hebrew means two different meanings. It has two different meanings. First meaning of the word Modeh is thanking. Ani Modeh lecha, I thank you. What is the second meaning? Modeh means I admit. I admit that you're right, I admit that that's the truth, I admit that what he said is correct. Those two words really symbolize everything about Judaism. What does Hashem expect from a Jew every day? Two things. One, to admit that he is in charge of everything and everything depends on his decision, that's of course, that's one foundation. And the second is, don't take anything for granted. Always be thankful for the good, and what you think is bad, also say thank you. What you think is good, not necessarily is good. You wait 20 years later, you see that it wasn't so good. What you think is bad, sometimes can be the best thing can happen to you, you don't know yet. I'll give you an example. Uh, uh, one person bought in Israel a brand new car. A brand new nice car. You know, you don't find that many like this. Yeah, yeah. A nice fancy car, so he drives all the way up to Yerushalayim. And he had a friend, but the friend was kind of a little, not really jealous, but the friend said, wow, how, Hashem, why is the, this guy has the schud, the mazal, the luck, to have such a nice car, it flies all the way up to Yerushalayim, to Jerusalem, and I have to take a bus. He was thinking to himself from time to time how lucky is his friend compared to him. But after a few months, since his friend got the car, on the way to Yerushalayim, the other guy is taking the bus. As he's taking the bus, he sees traffic, police, ambulance. As he passes through the accident, he sees his friend's car. is smashed completely. And he screams from the window to the cop there, to the policeman, what happened? Any casualties? Say, yeah, the whole family in that car, they all got killed. So, Rav Zilberstein brought it in his book, Alenu Leshabeach, he said, when they got the car, did anybody ever imagine that this nice, comfortable, fancy car that is so smooth and he rides everywhere, that this car will be their cemetery, that they'll be buried there? Nobody ever dreamed. You don't know what you think is good can be bad, what you think is bad can turn good. You don't know yet. You have no idea. That's why I always tell people, you know, when, when people uh, have a boy, have a baby boy. Everyone's very excited, especially if it's the first one. Everybody comes, Mazal Tov, Mazal Tov, Mazal Tov, in a brief. So I always, I always uh, wonder to myself, would they be able to tell him in 20 years from now for the same boy Mazal Tov? Maybe yes, maybe not. If he will turn a nice shiny tzaddik, learning Torah, doing mitzvot, Baal Chesed, not a criminal, somebody like that, then it's million times, million reasons to say Mazal Tov. But if it's in 20 years, it's going to be Esav. What are you telling him Mazal Tov now? If you only knew that this boy will be a little Hitler, would you tell him Mazal Tov? He's, gro he's growing now a Pere Adam, a wild beast. You don't know yet. All the babies look cute. You remember, Hitler also used to be a cute baby when he was a kid. Did anybody ever imagine when he, when he got born, people told his parents, uh, congratulations, no? What did they say? What do you think they say when he came to the world? Or Saddam, or Arafat? What, they, what people told their parents? Congratulations, Mabruk in Arabic. 
Yeah, and 20 years later he became a terrorist, murdering people. It's not such a reason to say Mazal Tov, right? So that's the point here. You don't know. That's why we have to accept everything that Hashem gives us as a part of the plan. It's all according to schedule. So, Abraham came and got the reward for all the people. Why? Because Abraham gave, gave them seminars. Ah, you didn't listen? No problem. I'm getting your reward. So There's a no-lose situation. You always win. So, the, the third Mishnah, Asara Nisyonot Nitnasa Avraham Avinu Alav Shalom. Hashem tested Avraham Avinu in ten different tests until he agreed to be close with him. You understand? And to nominate him to be the most important person in the world. And only after Avraham passed all the ten tests, then HaKadosh Baruch Hu came and put a stamp on him. Now I know you're fearful from Hashem. Which was the last ten? that he told him to take his son Yitzchak for the Akedah. Right after Abraham took him and did everything Hashem says, comes the angel and says, don't touch him. And Abraham wants to cut a little bit from his, from, his, from his body, you know, to make a little cut. At least some blood comes out. Like this, I made a mitzvah. So the angel said, no, 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 don't even reach your finger to him. Don't touch him. It's already, the mitzvah was done already perfect. You don't have to do anything. And that's it. So when Abraham went to do that last test, the angel told him in the name of Hashem, Atayadati. Now I know that you fear Hashem. Atayadati ki elokim ata. Now I know you are fearful from Hashem, you respect Hashem, that you are a real tzaddik. You understand? So this is it. Now, why, what are we learning from this? What are we learning from Abraham Avinu that had to go through so much in his life? Now you have to remember, our job is much, much easier than Abraham Avinu. Why? Because we already have Torah. We have a way to know what Hashem expects from us. We know what Hashem expecting from us. So, yeah, even less, not so hard for the... Yeah. So, the, so the, que the question is, a Jew has all the reason, all the reason to follow the Torah and to know what Hashem wants from him. But Abraham didn't know anything. He didn't have a document in his hand that he knows what Hashem expects from him. Yeah, all he knew, all, no, Ruach HaKodesh came after he became a tzaddik, not before. So all he knew, common sense, that there's one God. It's all common sense. He, he made like an investigation on his own to find out who is the creator, it doesn't make sense that it's going to be the sun or the moon or the statues. And slowly, slowly he was searching for God. It's not that he was born all of a sudden and he knows all... No, no, no. Only after he showed Hashem that he's so anxious to be close to him, that's when Hashem agreed to be close to him. So we see that in this world, a person that wants to be close to Hashem has to sweat a lot. Has to break ex every one of his bad traits to get rid of all his negative, to put all his efforts, and then maybe one day Hashem will agree to take his arm and reach him and pull him closer to him. Some people think, one, two, three, I'm going to make hocus pocus, a shortcut, I'll be a tzaddik. Why? I'll grow a beard, put a nice hat, I wear a nice kilt, I learn uh, half an hour a day Torah for a few months, yeah, I'm a, I'm a Kabbalist. I already have a direct line to Hashem. No, it doesn't work that way. That's why I, wa I once say that and I say it again. Anybody who doesn't know substantial amount of Torah can never be holy. Don't believe him, I have dreams, I see things, I see that she's not good for you, you cannot marry her, the names do not match. I see who was your grandmother, who was your mother. I see that in this house you have all kinds of uh, clouds over there, you know, you need to do a tikkun. If he's a big chacham, if Rabbi Ovadia Yosef tells you something like this, you have to take it into consideration. As a, as a holy man, he learned Torah 80, 85 years all his life. There is a chance that he sees things. There is a chance. But I promise you that from him you'll never hear that kind of nonsense. Don't believe me? Test me. You go to him, if he'll tell you one of this mystic baloney, I'll give you anything you want. Here, it's recorded. From the big Chachamim, from Rav Chaim Kanievsky, from Rav Ovadia, from Rav Ben Zion Abba Shaul, Alava Shalom, that passed away 12 years ago, from Rav Eliashiv, from any big giant Chacham, 
you'll never hear that nonsense. We have to check, I see something, I look, show me your forehead, I see things on you. I see you didn't go to the mikveh today. I see that you're doing something wrong. You never talk like this. That's why in Israel, the Chilonim, they make fun of religion. Why? There's so many phony people that they make the religion look like a joke. And all these fake babot, they are the first one who goes to hell. Why? Even they kept some mitzvot. They keep Shabbat, they put filin, they come to shul every day. They do something, no? It's not that they don't keep. But they made the, the religion such a nasty reputation that they are the reason why a million uh, Jews do not want to hear about religion. It's their fault. It's not... The, the real holy rabbis that they know things, even if they know they don't come and brag about it. Even if they know. Even if they know. Rav Ben Zion Abba Shaul was, he has Ruach HaKodesh for sure. And if people will argue about a question in Yeshiva, he never pushed his nose to say, no, he's right, don't waste his time. He's right, never. Even if they came to ask him, he said, no, why are you coming to me? Go to him, he knows. Go to that rabbi. Never wanted to show off. The opposite of what we used to. This generation, there's one problem. Why there's so many fakers? Some people, it's their nature. They're just cooks. They are cooks in their nature, in everything. They lie, they deceiving. They do a lot of not kosher things. This is their nature, and they have to correct their nature. You know, just learning one or two hours a day Torah or put a yamaka and grow a beer doesn't make you a better human being, not necessarily. It can affect you, of course, but it's hard work to get rid of your negative traits. It's very hard work. So why there's so many fakers? Even those who are naturally not crooks, they came to the conclusion that the only way to receive money from the people is to pretend that I'm a holy Baba, because they don't give otherwise. If I know the whole Torah by heart, they won't give me a penny. If I pretend that I can cure people and do all kinds of nonsense, they'll give me tons of money. They stand online by my house all day to give me. And I need the money for my yeshiva, for my children, to send them to yeshiva. I'm going to be a faker. That's the only way to get money. That's how sad it became. So today, if you come and you don't look like a holy baba, then you don't have a chance that they'll give you a penny to your yeshiva or to your cause. You want to get money from them? You have to pretend... Tell them take some flowers, put under your yamaka when you go to sleep, go like this, kiss the mezuzah 17 times, make sure you don't wear red, all kinds of nonsense they make up. Oh really, Rabbi? You, you, what do you see on me? That's what's going on today. And believe me, you're laughing. I, I have no doubt that you stood online once in your lifetime <laughs> to this Bible. <laughs> all right. So, the next Mishnah, Asara nisim na'asu la'avotenu. This whole parak is talking about ten, number ten. Ten miracles were done to our fathers in Egypt. Ten in Egypt and ten while they're crossing the ocean. Ten and ten. Ten plagues. HaKadosh Baruch Hu strike the Egyptians in Egypt. And ten different punishments in the ocean. Ten tests. The nation of Israel dare to do to God. They tested him to see if he's really reliable. Believe it or not, yes. And the Torah said, don't test me. Do not test me as your fathers tested me in the desert. It's a pasuk in the Torah. Lo tenaset Hashem elokecha. Do not test me. I'm not your friend from high school. With all due respect. You just obey my rules. Obey my orders for your own good. Don't say, some people say, Rabbi, when I'll be rich, of course I'll be religious. What reason I won't have to be religious? When I make 10 million dollars, I'll close my business on Shabbat. I'll be very religious. It's worth nothing. The idea is to be religious now, to close the business now, when it seems that you lose fortune. Now, it's a re that's the test. Uh, Rabbi, I'm single. It's hard for me to be religious alone. <laughs> How am I going to keep Shabbat? My parents live in a different state. I'm here alone in New York. Why do you expect me now? I'm going to cook for myself alone. I don't even know how to make an omelet. How am I going to keep Shabbat? Stupid excuses that you don't know if to laugh or to cry when you hear it. Wow. Sleep in bed all Shabbat. Better off. Don't talk this nonsense. 
just do it because that's the obligation. No, Rabbi, but it's, 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 it's boring to be alone the whole Shabbat. Someone who connects to the Torah, no matter where you are, you're never bored. You're standing by the doctor on the line, you're on the way to the bank, uh, you're in traffic, you are never bored. Never bored. Why? You always have this book with you. Okay, you're standing, you're stuck, no problem, you learn another Mishnah. Traffic moving, you put the book away, you drive, you stop, you learn another or. Or you listen to a good tape. Or everywhere you go, you make sure you have a book. Shabbat, you're bored, you're alone, you're in a dorm, you're in college, I don't know where. Your friend went to the beach, let them go, you take your books, close yourself in a room, opportunity to learn 12, 13 hours Torah. Gold mine. No, I'm bored. Why are you bored? You're bored because your mind is empty. From wisdom, that's why you're bored. Someone that his mind is full of, of wisdom is never bored. He's always thirsty for more knowledge. Knowledge goes to knowledge. That's what Hashem says. I like to give wisdom to wise people, not to foolish people. Because foolish people, obviously, they don't care about wisdom. If they care, they wouldn't be foolish. You understand the idea here? So, ten different tests. Shnei Emar, this is in Bamidbar, Yudalet, Vayenasu Oti Ze Eser Pe'amim Velo Shamu Bekoli. They tested me ten different times and did not listen to me. The fifth Mishnah in this Perek is ten different miracles Hashem did to the nation of Israel in the days of Bet HaMikdash. When Bet HaMikdash, when the holy temples were standing, there were ten miracles eh, all the time. But obvious miracle! Nobody can argue if it's a miracle or it's nature. What? A woman never had a miscarriage ever for 410 years that the Bet HaMikdash was standing, or the second, which was 420 years, you know, to smell uh, the, the smell of the barbecue all the time, people that are a little bit hungry, a pregnant woman, and she smell it, and never to have one case of, of a miscarriage or something like this, is a big miracle. The meat, the butcher, you know, when they, when they chop the animal after they slaughter it and clean the skin and all that, they cut the meat, right? They tear the animal apart. Go to a butcher, see the dirt there on the floor, the dirt on the walls, how many flies are there, mosquitoes, bugs, flies, whatever, rats, whatever you want you have there. Whenever you have food, animals like to go there. Insects, they like to go there. Nobody ever saw a fly in Bet HaMikdash ever where they used to cut the meat. Possible? No, it's an obvious miracle. The meat never smelled. It was standing there hours in the hottest weather in the world. Israel is a very hot state. And there was no refrigerator like today. Just try to put in 110 degrees a, a piece of meat for six hours and see what's going to happen to it. How many worms and bad smell you're going to have. It never happened even once. What other miracles? The Kohen Gadol we know that if a man went to sleep and had a dream, and in the middle of his dream, seed came out of his body, that's a very bad sign for the entire year for him, if it happens on Yom Kippur in the morning, which means Yom Kippur was, let's say, tonight. Tomorrow morning, when he wake up to go to the shul, if he found that that's what happened to him in his dream, it's a sign that he should worry all year about his fortune. Nevertheless, if it's the high priest, the Kohen HaGadol of Bet HaMikdash, that now the entire nation of Israel depends on these few minutes that he goes inside Kodesh HaKodashim. They prepare him all year for those few minutes that he goes to the holiest site in the world. And something like this happened, it destroyed the whole plan of the whole year. That shows Hashem is not interested in our prayer, of the most critical prayer of the year. So... It never happened even once in the history of Bet HaMikdash. Then, it used to rain, right? It's raining. And Sukkot, around Sukkot, always it's raining. Sometimes a week before, sometimes a week after, but that's more or less where the rain begins. 
in Pesach, usually it's not raining, but the rain that fell never put off the fire of the Atzea Ma'arachai. They used to put the, 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 big, the pieces of, of uh, wood, and with that they light the fire, and sometimes it rained heavily on it. But the fire always remained. The rain never put the fire off. Everybody wondered, how can it be? It's so much rain falling on it, and the fire continued to burn. When the smoke comes out of the altar, it goes out through like a chimney, and it goes in a line. Smoke, usually right away spread all over, right? A slight wind, a very light wind, already make the smoke goes all over. If you have a, one of the restaurants here on Main Street, you stand five blocks away from there, you smell the, the food that they, 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 they burn, no? How do you smell it? Because they, they like you to smell it, so they make like a big tall chimney, it goes all the way up, and the smell goes to the entire area and calls the customer. Here we are. We have fresh steaks, we have uh, kebab, we have, uh, you know, chicken on the grill. It brings people to eat. The smell of the food makes people hungry. So, over there, when the smoke used to go up, it's like a laser line. Goes all the way up, no matter how windy it is, the, the smoke never goes left or right, stays always straight. And everybody was standing and looking at this line of smoke, how it goes up. That's an obvious miracle. Then, when there's also, there used to be Korban Omer after Pesach. They, they, they used to take the Omer that they cut, the first wheat, and they make a special thing, it's called Le'anif And also there's Mitzvah of Lechem Apanim. And Shnei Lechem, that they used to put, these breads that they used to put in Bet HaMikdash, they never had ever a problem with the bread, you know, because the way they used to do is like this. They used to, on the Ted Zayn Ben Nisan, on the 16th day of Nisan, what they, after, the, after the holiday, right the next day, that's by the way, in case you know what Kemach Yashan is, that you eat, uh, you eat special bread that was made from Kemach, from old flour, and there's new flour, the day after Pesach allows us all the wheat that they cut before. But it's not automatically. It used to do in Bet HaMikdash some kind of a ceremony that allows all the flowers that the people have to become kosher. And, you know, so... If they would find something not right with that, there's no way to replace it. They used to cut it in the night, the night before. They cut just enough for what they have to sacrifice. And if something went wrong with that, there's no way to replace it. That means we're stuck now for the whole year. We cannot use those tons of, tons of flowers and wheat that people cut all over Israel. It's all become obsolete. It's big. never happened once even. It's always went according to the plan. And the two lechem, shnei lechem, they used to bring in Chag Shavuot, shnei lechem, two, two loaves of bread. And this allowing the wheat, the new wheat, to bring it to the Mizbeach. The rest of the wheat was already allowed in Pesach. Seven weeks after Pesach, they do it once again, but this time for Bet HaMikdash. They never had an accident. It always worked according to the plan. And lechem apanim, once a week they were replacing the lechem apanim. was standing on a rack there. They used to take the, two, the old ones and put new ones every week. They used to bake it on Friday early evening, before Shabbat, they used to bake it. And then they set it on a table on Shabbat morning, lemochorat, on Shabbat. And it used to stand there until the following Shabbat, when they bring the two other breads, they take this one out. Right? So it's waiting, and then they give it to the Kohanim. If there was an accident, then they couldn't bring new bread, then the, those two breads would have to stay there. And then it creates a problem in the mitzvah, and it never happened once even. One other mitzvah is, you know in Bet HaMikdash, how much room you have. How many people can fit inside Bet HaMikdash, in a place where people are allowed? Parts of Bet HaMikdash, not everyone is allowed. In the area when the men and the women are allowed, few hundred people. Logically, only few hundred people can feed. But thousands of thousands of people would walk in like supposedly like sardines and there's still room. And nobody understands how so many people get into that, such a building. Not only that, now when they had to bow down, 
right? If you say modim or in, in other places that you have to bow down, where there is room to bow down? If you stand like a sardine, you cannot move. Everyone bow down and his head does not touch the back of the person in front of him. And that's like Omdim Tzafuf, standing very crowded, but they, when they bow down, all of a sudden they have room. There's something that nobody understands. Marash, clear miracle in front of their eyes. Mishtachavim revachim, the space between one to the other when they were bowing down. A snake or a scorpion never beat a person that came to Jerusalem. You have to remember, it wasn't like today, beautiful roads, marble, houses. No, it was all sand and rocks and trees and mountains and tons of bushes, tons of snake, tons of scorpions, all kinds of animals. And not once a person that was sleeping in the regal in a festival they're sleeping all over Yerushalayim. Some people got relatives or friends that they host them in their houses for the holiday, and some of them slept outside in tents. You know, it's like a nice picnic. But in, in places like this, there's a lot of danger. Not once a person got beat by a snake or a scorpion or anything poisonous. A person never told his friend ever in those days of the temple, when the temple was there, it's crowded here, there's no room to sleep. The entire nation, all the male from 13 years old and older, and some of them even brought the, you know, women and others, they came to Yerushalayim. Yerushalayim was packed with millions of people, and there was room for everybody to sleep. That's why they call it Eretz Vi, the land of the deer, like they have in, in Long Island, Deer Park. Why they call it Deer Park over there? Because there's a lot of deer there, or used to be at least at one point, I don't know today. But in Israel, in Yerushalayim, called deer, deer land for different reasons. Why? Because the skin of the deer, once you, first of all, deer it's kosher. It's hard to find it because it's very expensive. I know there's a restaurant in Upper West Side that sells deer daily. Uh, and deer, when you take off the skin of the deer, it stretch a lot. You can stretch it and stretch it and stretch it. It's much like a rubber band. You stretch it and you stretch it again. So if it was small in the beginning, you come after a few hours, it's already ten times bigger. They stretch it. It's called Eretz V. They stretch and they stretch and they stretch. That's why Jerusalem called Eretz V. Why? Because it seems that no matter how many people are coming, it's still room for everybody. This is it. Then, the sixth Mishnah, ten things were created on Erev Shabbat. And in Shabbos Eve, just because, before Shabbat started, there's a period of time we call Ben HaShmashot. Shemesh in Hebrew means sun. Shmashot means sons in plural, more than one. What does it mean between the sons? Between the beginning of the sunset, when the sun, when you stand by the ocean, you see the ball of sun, right? It's starting to disappear. The bottom of the sun starting to disappear, right? You see all the way in the horizon, you see the sun is, is, is round. Now the, the bottom of the sun is already disappearing. It became like a line. It's not a circle anymore. That means this is the beginning of the sunset. When is it going to end? Until you see the sun completely disappear. In Israel, this period is very quick, because it depends where is this country on the globe. The more closer you are to the, to the center, the longer it takes. You understand why? Because it's a wide, wide circle. It takes longer. Uh, the earth goes around his, uh, his center 1,700 kilometers an hour. So in Israel, it's only 13 and a half minutes that it takes from the beginning to the end until it becomes officially night. That's called Ben Hashmashot, 13 and a half minutes. In America, it's much longer. Or in Europe. It can be, in America, it can go in a summer time even 40 minutes between the time that the sun begins to disappear, until it disappears completely, it's 40 minutes, even more than that. That's how long it can be. This time called Ben Hashmashot. Every time the Gemara or the Torah speaking about events that connects to time, it always go by the time of Eretz Israel. 
This is the official time of God, according to this earth. Even though in New York we are seven hours behind, or in LA it's ten hours behind, and in some places it's even big difference. We don't care so much about the rest of the world because everything the Gemara speaks about is according to Eretz Israel. They say Ben Hashmashot speaking about Eretz Israel. They say in heaven at midnight, Hakadosh Baruch Hu go to heaven to connect with the righteous people at midnight, Jewish midnight. When is it according to Israel, not according to you? Ac- everything is according to the holy place, to the holy land. You know, somewhere in the ocean, there is a line, it's called the date line. Did you hear about that, the date line? You know, like in Australia, when they had uh, 2YK, you remember 2YK in the year 2000? When everybody was nervous, maybe now from 1999, it turns to 2000. Everybody was nervous. I remember it was Shabbat. I myself was nervous. I have a little money on my account. Imagine I get up on Motsi Shabbos, I turn the computer on, the bank lost record. They didn't know what's going to happen to the computer. I was thinking to myself, what's the real rich people is going to do? They have probably tons of money, big corporation, company. Imagine if, they, if everything will be wiped out. The bank were trying to say, don't worry, we've been working on it for years. We have backups. Everybody was worried. But I, few, mamash before Shabbat, I had an idea. I said to myself, in Australia, it was already midnight. Before Shabbat, here started. And computers are computers everywhere. The same thing, the same concept. So I was searching to see what happened in Australia. Like this, we know what's going to happen here. God forbids a, a, an emergency alert armies, w- weapon, can mess up the whole world. They, they, well, they, everybody says it's the end of the world, the end of the world. I don't know if you remember, but we're only talking 11 years ago. Some of you are very young. But. So anyway, I already knew that everything went smooth in Australia. Mamash, before Shabbat started, I still was a little bit nervous what's going to happen here, but everything went smooth. But you have to know one thing. Somewhere in the ocean, there is a line. Why this line is important? It's called the date line. Which means, if you make one step to the right of that line, it's Shabbat. If you make one step to the other side of the line, it's Sunday. So now, it's very interesting. Why? Because a person that once, let's say he has a boat, and he got to that line. You see that line, this line. If he turned the boat three feet to the right, he can light a cigarette, finish his cigarette, he turns his boat back, now it's Shabbat. I'm back in Shabbat. What else do I need? I have an important phone call to make. I move the boat three feet to the other. Uh, I went back Sunday now. I make a phone call. It's not a joke. Allah Hakli is not... What is it like? The person that, let's say, well, he went on a plane in, uh, in uh, New York two hours before Shabbos. Let's say it was an emergency, whatever you want to call it. Two hours, and you have to fly to L.A., and it's five hours flight. Two hours before Shabbos, you fly to L.A.? What are you counting on? That L.A. is three hours behind. You're going against time. You're going back in history. You're going towards the past. It's very interesting. It's like traveling on time. So you land a minute before Shabbat. You re- actually, in reality, you went out from the airport, and for you, you did not, you were not Mechalel Shabbat, even though technically you left when there's no chance not to be Mechalel Shabbat because of the time over there. I'll give you an example. I, I know in Hong Kong, it's, re- it's reality that a person will fly in Motzei Shabbat from Hong Kong to Israel, and when he gets to Israel, it will be Shabbat. You understand what I'm saying here or not? You left in Motzei Shabbat and you arrived to Israel, it's Shabbat. They tell you, you have to keep Shabbat now. He said, what do you mean? I made Avdalah already before I left. <laughs> but you go back in time. So finally, when you get to Israel, they still have Shabbat over there. I don't know, three, four in the afternoon. It's very interesting. Those are the most complicated questions in al like, for instance, what happens if you move to the North Pole or to Finland? Six months is dark. Six months is light. 
How many times a year you have to put fill in? Because maybe it's one day, one night, that's the entire year. They don't have 365 normal days there. Day and night, 12 hours, 12 hours. It's six months, a very long day, and then six months, very long night. So maybe when it becomes light, I have to put one time fill in, Shema Israel finished. Now it's six month night, I don't know how you put fill in in the night. Or your son is born, when it's dark. When, when did you hear about making a circumcision in the middle of the night? Complete dark, they have to do Brit Milah. When? You have to wait for the sunrise at least, no? Zrizi Magdim, Ashkem Avram Baboker, but there's no Boker over there. It's dark all the time. Yeah, there are many books who were written about all these complicated issues. The real solution is, believe it or not, that the Jew is not allowed to live in these places. There's too many doubts in his life. What to do, how to do, when you pray Arvit, and when it's six month light. You pray Amariv Aravim. What's Aravim? There's no Erev. You're lying in your tefillah. Big problems. <laughs> Maybe one time we have time, we'll just talk about these issues. Anyway, so. The whole idea of the day, day, daylight, the date, is really one step here, it's Sunday, one step back, it's Shabbat, and you travel back and forth as many times as you want. In reality, every time you did something, it was a Sunday. This place, it's Sunday. Because you always go by the place where you arrive there. For instance, in Tisha B'Av, you fast. And you take a flight in the morning to Israel. So when you fly to Israel, your fast will be seven hours shorter. Why? Because when you get to Israel, let's say you left in the middle of the night, midnight, right? In Israel it's seven in the morning. By the time you get to Israel, already it's night there. You just saved yourself several hours of fasting. What happens if it's the opposite? They come from midnight from Israel to here, they have to fast extra seven hours if they're not sick. They're sick, it's, it could be a life risk. But if it's healthy people, too bad, my friend. Over here we're still fasting, you cannot eat. The day is not over. And many other examples like this. Okay, the, next, the next Mishnah, as I started to explain, so there is a term in Judaism, it's called Ben Hashmashot. But this is a time that it's a doubt. When the official day is over, is it over when the sun begins to go down in the horizon or when it's completely going down? Until you finally see three stars. It's called Seta Kochavim. Since it's not 100% clear, it's a doubt. So if it's a doubt, we have a big problem. For instance, if we have to do a mitzvah now, but we're not sure, it's Friday. Maybe it's Shabbat. So let's say I want to drive to Shul. Since I'm not sure now, let's see, at eight, last Shabbat it was 8.13, right? 8.13 the sunset. You see it's still night, it's still day outside. When you drive to Shul, like 8.10 you arrive to Shul a few minutes before Shabbat. In reality, maybe you could have drive, drive another half an hour. But we cannot take the risk, because maybe it's Shabbat already 100%. Well, we're going to drive on Shabbat, it's a big risk. We don't take risk. Why driving? It's a sin from the Torah. It's like lighting fire. The Torah says, Lot of Arush, Bechol Moshevot Eren, so we cannot take a risk. However, when Shabbos is over, at 8.13, we are not finishing Shabbos. We started at 8.13, but we don't finish at 8.13, last Shabbat. We finish an hour later. Why? Because this is the period of doubt. So we start, we are, we are strict in the beginning of Shabbat, and we are strict in the end of Shabbat. However, there is a mitzvah that you're not allowed to clean the table after Suda Shlishi, the third meal, until Shabbat, Shabbat is officially over. Why? You do not make preparation from Shabbat to a weekday. It's not respect for Shabbat to use the holiest day to start preparing things for Sunday. So you're not cleaning the table. You can do it on Friday night. You clean the table because you're preparing it from Shabbat morning meal. So it's from Shabbat to Shabbat, it's no problem. From Shabbat morning to Shabbat afternoon, it's still no problem, it's still Shabbat. But Shabbat afternoon, late afternoon, to prepare it for the, for the Motzei Shabbos meal, you're not allowed. You have to wait when Shabbat is finished, then you clear the table. This law, it's the law from Rabbanan, not from the Torah. 
Rabbanan say it's disrespect, disrespecting Shabbat, preparing for Sunday. Don't do it. Since it's a mitzvah from the Rabbanan, we have a rule. Every mitzvah the Rabbanan, from the rabbis, that the rabbis made that decree, if there is a doubt, we allow to go to the lenient side. Every mitzvah from the Torah, if there's a doubt, we're not allowed to go to the lenient side. We have to go to the strict side, if there's a doubt. So, we're not allowed to light a cigarette 8.14. Why? Maybe Shabbat will be over 9.14. There's a period of time that it's a doubt. Nobody touch fire, because it's a mitzvah from the Torah. But to clear the table, after it became already the sunset, the beginning of the sunset, maybe Shabbos is over. For mitzvot the Rabbanan, you're allowed to be lenient. What is it like? I'll give you another example. Some people, they finish Shabbat 45 minutes after the Shkia, like in Queens, in most places, in some places in Israel. Some places, they keep Shabbat an extra half an hour. It's called Rabbeinu Tam. They go to the most strict opinion. Some people say 45 minutes, it's way after Shkia, it's night already, Shabbat is over. What happens if you're not like this? You keep 72 minutes, that's, the, that's the, strict, the strictest time, 72 minutes after sunset. And you came out of shul, they finished to pray, for them it's already Sunday. Every, every Shabbat they're doing like this. 45 minutes after, they finish the prayer of Saturday night, they get into their cars and they drive home. But you, you used from your place, from your hometown, all your life you kept 72 minutes. Now the, the, the home where you're staying, it's three miles or two miles. And your host, the one that you stay by him for Shabbos, is keeping only 45 minutes. Are you allowed to go into the car for him to give you a ride? You are not driving. You're sitting, you're doing nothing. He's driving for him, it's Sunday. Every week for him at this time, Shabbat is over. He doesn't make any sin, according to his shita. For you, you just sit in a car. Is it permitted or not? The answer is yes. Why? Because it's not a sin from the Torah. For me to drive, it's a sin from the Torah. I cannot take a risk. But just sitting in a car doing nothing, it's a sin from the Rabbanan. It's called Marit Ein. As people look at you in Shabbat, sitting in a car, it's... It's, it's disrespecting Shabbat. But since for so many people here Shabbat is over and they begin to drive, he can open the car for me. I cannot open the door because opening the door I turn the light on. So it's like lighting, lighting fire. So he opened the door for me. I sit in a car. He closes it. He drives me home. He saves me to sweat. Another gallon of sweat. Especially in Israel. Two steps. It's a sauna already. So if you know halacha, you can take advantage on so many shortcuts and not violate any rules. Problem that most people have, they never learn. So every time they don't know what to do, they are forced to suffer for no reason. They have to walk now, but don't worry. Even if you suffer for no reason, Hashem is faithful to pay you for every step. Why? Because after all, you chose to do it because you you're not sure what to do. You didn't want to violate any rule. Hashem said, you know what, I appreciate it. But do me a favor, next time don't be a fool. It's about time you start learning. I'm not interested that you suffer because of your ignorance. You understand? That's the truth. So, ten things were created in that period of time that we call Ben Hashmashot. Between the sunset until the arrivals of the stars. Those thirteen and a half minutes in Israel, Hashem was creating still things. The creation was finished. Adam was created. Chava was created, the whole, all the animals, the sun, the moon, the, everything. There were few things, ten things, that Hashem, for whatever reason, waited until the last minute to create them. And He created that in that period of time. What are they? Piaret. What does it mean, Piaret? Their place that the land eventually one day will open up to swallow Korach and 250 rabbis that came with him to demonstrate against Moshe Rabbeinu. That area of the land needed a special entrance, a special, uh, uh, like, a, like a tunnel, to send them all the way down to where they went. This was prepared in those 
13 and a half minutes, what we call Ben Hashmashot. Pia Be'er, the well that will go with the nation of Israel as they walk in the desert and get, ma and get water from this well, this well was created in those few minutes after the sunset. Then, Pia Aton, the mouth of the donkey of Bilam. It was a, another regular mouth. A donkey that speaks, asks questions. The donkey. Donkey of Bilam. So Hashem created that mouth of this donkey also in the Ben Hashmashot. Hakeshet, the rainbow. The rainbow is a sign. Every time you see a rainbow, that Hashem swore that He will never bring flood to kill universe, like He did in the time of Noah 4,200 years ago. So this, the, the rainbow is connecting between heaven and earth in beautiful colors. The colors that you see is only because of the angle of the light that it breaks the water, because it's water really. So you know, if you highlight the water in diff from different angles, you see different colors. That's what really happened. If you ever have a sprinkle system, sometimes you can see, you don't have to look up. You can see already different colors on the water. Because it depends how the sun hits the water, in, from what direction. This is it. Why at night it's easier to hear noise? In a day, if your friend's standing across the street and he speaks to you normally without screaming, you don't hear him. Without cars, let's say no cars here in the neighborhood. He stands across the street, he calls you, you don't hear him. At night, even he whisper, you hear him. Every beep he makes you hear from across the street. Why? Because the waves of the voice are interfered by the, by the sun. The sunlight cuts the, the waves of the voice that go from my mouth to his ears. The light cutting it and delaying it. They're going not as smooth. So it's very difficult to receive the message because there is a resistance. But at night, you don't have the sun to cut it. So the voice travel express. So you hear much better. That's the reason. So, the rainbow, the man, the special bread that Hashem gave them in the 40 years they were in the desert, that man, the special man was created, the ingredient that called man was created, Ben Hashmashot. Hamate, the stick of Moshe Rabenu, he split the ocean, he hit the rock with that stick. That stick was prepared from that time. Shamir, Shamir is a special worm that if you put the worm on a hardest rock that you can find, you make like, like let's say a line, and you make, the, you make that worm crawl on that line. This line has some kind of enzyme it releases some kind of material, like a laser. And it cuts the hardest raw material you can think of, it cut it. How much? It's amazing. That's how they used to cut the rocks in the time of King Solomon and Bet Amikdash, Shamir. Today we don't know where it is in the world. It's disappeared from the world because nature changed. Many animals that the Gemara speaks about, we don't find them anymore. But Shamir used to walk and cut the rocks. He walks over the rock, Today we have laser instead. The laser cut it. But this is how it was. You know how they cut diamonds? They used to cut diamonds with a special sword. That is, the, the, the edge of the sword is also diamond. Diamond cuts diamond. But today they don't need They have a laser. The laser cut it. So this Shamir was created uh, also in Ben Hashmashot. Achtav, the writing... The writing that we have was created in Ben Hashmashot. Hamichtav, the boards that the writing went on, right? Where the writing goes on, on the boards. So the boards were also created. And Hamichtav, what does it mean Hamichtav? It says, Hamichtav, Michtav, Elokim, Hu Charut al Aluchot. The miracle of the, of the Ten Commandments was that no matter from what side you look at that, you always read it. So if I'm holding the book like this, and you can read, if I would read, if I see through, it would be the opposite. I can't read. All the letters are opposite, right? But the miracle was that if I read now, and he's reading, we read the same thing. 
from both sides. Also, the Samech, Samech of the Ten Commandments, if you take a rock, you have a board, right? A marble. And you take a special, uh, special uh, driller and you drill a circle. That's the letter Samech, it's a circle. What happened to the piece in the middle? It falls out, right? Because you made a whole circle, you drill a circle. The middle should fall out. This little circle in the middle stayed in the air. No matter where you took it, it was standing, it never fell. There's miracles, there's, there's days of miracles. As you read in the Torah, there's more than a hundred miracles described in the Torah. If one of them would happen today, the people would stand for a year shocked. They wouldn't believe. But in the times of the Torah, they saw it in front of their eyes. So those are the ten things that were created. Now, so far, this ten, everybody agree. There are some that are questionable. There's arguments between the Chachamim. Some say, Afamazikim, the demons. Those demons, I once said in one of my, I have a lecture in my website about demons. There are six different kinds of demons. What are they? Three of them are like people, and three of them are like angels. Which means three are 100% spiritual, and three are half spiritual, half human. Which means they eat and they also release. They go to the bathroom. Uh, they physical, they really have, they have physical abilities, they push us when we go, very interesting. And some are mamash like angels, they don't have any material in them. They don't eat, they don't have exits, nothing like this. These demons, some say that the demons were made on those minutes, some say it was, it was created on Monday. When hell was created, those demons also were created. The place of the burial of Moshe, Moses, nobody knows where he was buried. Hashem didn't want him to be buried in a public place because then everybody would worship him and make him a god. So Hashem hid this place. Yes? No, that's when he gave him the Torah. So he went up. Also he went up. But, uh, but it says that Hashem buried Moshe, but nobody knows until this day when he was buried. Then the isle, the... Uh, not the deer, the isle is the ram, the ram of Avraham Avinu. When Abraham came to slaughter Isaac, what happened? The angel told him, don't touch him. What's the next thing he saw? A ram, his horns is stuck in a bush, right? That ram was prepared from him from those minutes of the creation and Ben Hashmashot of Friday night. And the last thing is Tzvat, it's like a plier. You know Tzvat what it is? I don't know how to say it in English, but it's very similar to a plier. Plier has two handles. When you press on them, on the edge, it's closed, right? And he holds the screws or pulls the nails. Why he needed to create Tzvat? Why? Because the only way to create Tzvat, this plier, this specific plier that I'm talking about, is with another plier. So who's going to create the first plier? There's no way to create a plier without a plier. So they say that this plier was also made in those 13 and a half minutes, what we call Ben Hashmashot. We finish that Mishnah. The next Mishnah is the seventh Mishnah in chapter 5. Seven different traits in Golem, in a fool, and seven traits in a wise person. Now we are going to compare, let's see in what category we belong. Now it's an opportunity for us to know what, where are we. Are we in the foolish side or are we in the wise side? A chacham, a smart person, a wise person, no medaber bifne mishu gadol mimeno bachokma. Never dare to open his mouth when there is a person that is higher than him in knowledge, whether it's in religion, whether it's in medicine, whether it's in computer, it doesn't really matter, right? If I know X amount of Torah, and I'll be in a room with one very big chacham that everybody knows is one of the giants of the world, and somebody would ask a question, of course I won't jump to answer, I'll be embarrassed in front of him. Say, Kvod Arav, please, see for play. You answer. If he gives you permission, it's a different story. Same thing in medicine. 
You are a beginner doctor. You're 25 years old. You came out of medical school yesterday. Just yesterday you learned what Advil does to the body. And here comes a professor, 60 years old, 45 years of brain surgeries, well known all over the world, write articles, write uh, books, teaching in universities, you and him. Can you eat in the same plate? Come on, back there, you're in a different league. Imagine he talks and you break into his words in front of people. It doesn't work. So smart person recognize my place, my level. When I'm the smartest in the room, no, let me teach them something. But when there's a giant here, I have to be mute, right? Give him the stage. I don't belong here. You understand? That's a way to know if you're smart or foolish. The foolish people, they never stop making noise. All day. It's called, the Gemara says, Istera belagina kish kish karya. You take a tzedakah box, you fill it up with tons of coins, hundreds of coins, when you try to shake it, you don't hear any noise. It's very silent. Then you take the box, you put one penny inside, you shake it, Ooh, how much noise. Empty box with one penny makes a lot of noise. I know people, excuse my language, but I know people, <laughs> they know maybe, maybe they know enough Torah to speak ten minutes. That's it. Tell them, okay, tell me all the Torah you know. He begin, 10 minutes later, you assume he didn't forget. Let's say he's a person with very strong memory. He remembers everything. 10 minutes he talks, his Torah is over. When a person dies, he has 40 days in a row to speak divrei Torah in his trial. In a row, 40 days, 40 nights, non-stop. You have to prepare 40 days full of Torah. You understand? So... Maybe 10 minutes he knows Torah, but when you go to places, how much noise is going to make with this 10 minutes knowledge that he has, you have no idea. But when you see somebody who already wrote hundreds of books, he comes, he doesn't show who he is. You know, I once told you a story about the Shagat Arye. I told you the story or no? Shagat Arye was a very poor rabbi. Very, very, very poor. But a huge, giant scholar. One time, in the old days, the poor people, you know, when they walk from one place to the other, they walk. They didn't have horses, they couldn't afford. They walk, some of them had shoes, some of them even shoes they didn't have. They walk, hundreds of miles a year, they walk. And they walk from one city to another. So what happened is, it's very interesting. He arrived to a place for a city that they have a shul there for Shabbat. And in the end of the Friday night uh, davening, they see which poor people are staying in the shul. That means they don't have a place to eat for Shabbos. So they share them to families. So the rabbi saw him, an older person like this. Oh, you come to my house to eat. I took him to his house. And he say, no, after we ate, maybe the guest would say a nice Dvar Torah for us. So he, he said to him, please speak. So he said a few words, a few minutes. The rabbi was impressed from the Divrei Torah, but he knew from what book he took it. But he got upset that he doesn't give credit to the source. Because in Judaism you have to be honest. If you say something that you heard from that specific rabbi, you have to give him the credit. I heard from Rabbi X, such and such, beautiful Dvar Torah. I heard from Rabbi Y, this and this. Don't take it to yourself, I invented it. It's my idea, and Hashem cannot stand crooks like this. No, just give the credit to one who deserves it. So you see this old man, he doesn't give credit to the book, to the rabbi that wrote the book. And maybe today it happens to him, no? Tomorrow I'll test him again. Tomorrow the same story. Say Dvar Torah, from the same book, he doesn't give credit to the book. Maybe it's over again. Huh? No, no, no. He doesn't give credit to the book. Then he said, I'm going to give him one last chance in Saudash Lishit, in the third meal. Imagine if he would say the same Tvar Torah from the same book and won't give credit. I have to attack him, I don't care. I got to teach him a lesson, this guy. Saudash Lishit, beautiful Tvar Torah from the same book. Say, so you have the nerve, the whole Shabbat, you're giving me words of Torah from the book of the Shagat Aryeh. Not, you did not even mention him in a hint. Nothing. 
So the old man, he looks at him like the, he got nervous. The rabbi got upset. The rabbi said, wait, wait, I'll prove to you what I'm talking about. He ran right away to the shelf. He brought a beautiful, big, nice, heavy book with leather cover, all handmade. He brings the book. He opens the book. This is hundreds of years ago. You know how the antique old books used to look. Uh, today it would be a fortune to buy a book like this. He opened the book. What you say last night is in this page. What you said this morning is here. And what you just said now, oh, it's right here. And you didn't say one word for the book. So the old man looked at the book, he started to cry. He said, Ah, Shemo. In the books I look so much better than my real life. <laughs> he, that's his book. He was the rabbi that wrote the book. The rabbi never saw his face. Everybody knows. Shagat, Shagat, Ariel. Nobody ever imagined he's such a homeless. Walking in the street with a bag of flour that he will have a piece of bread to eat. When he, so the rabbi started to cry, forgive me, it's you, ah, you ah, what a bishop, sorry. He said, no, no, you meant well. But at least in the books I look nice, not like my real life, begging for a piece of bread. <laughs> so anyway, so... Achacham enom daber bifnemi shegadol meno bachokma. Person that's smart, when he sees somebody is greater than him, I don't interfere. When he speaks to someone, even in an argument, he doesn't break into his words, he waits until he finishes, then he talks. He has patience. He never gets scared when somebody attacks him with questions. He never loses concentration, he's always listening, he doesn't lose his temper, he's concentrated, he knows what to say in the right time. He talks to the point, short and to the point. Not to say one thing, sometimes he gives an hour speech, just to ask a quick question that he can ask it in a second. Sometimes I have people write me an email, three pages, I finish my whole day to read their life story, in the end to ask me a question about something that I say in the lecture, they could have asked me that in three words. Like, one, two, three, I would answer in three, four words, and it will be over. Now I have to sit an hour until they get to the point. What's the point? To waste somebody else's time? It's not a mitzvah. The point is, quick to the point. What is this and this and this? That's it. So, meshiv ka'alacha. Also, when you answer, don't make it a, a cyclopedia now. Quick to the point. Let the guy get the points. The, the rest around it is not always important. Then, to speak in the right order, it's very important. Some people, they mix up, the, the, when they try to explain a story, they mix up. They go up, they go back, they go up, they go reverse, Oof, they get confused. What came before what? Omer al Rishon, Rishon, he start from the first, Ve'al Acharon, Acharon, and finish with the last thing. In a right chronological order. Or when you want to ask a question, sometimes it's a combination of few questions. You have to know which question to ask first, second, third, and fourth. Because if you mix the order, sometimes none of them will be clear. It won't make sense. You have to know how to talk. On something that he never heard, he's not embarrassed to say, I don't know. I never heard. Ah. Nobody would laugh at you. It's only here in the lecture they laugh. But if you say, I don't know, people appreciate you more. Learn from Rashi. Rashi, in few places, you can count on one or two hands in the entire Tanakh and the Gemara. He wrote, Velo yadati echani. I don't know this. I don't know where it's come from. I don't know the, the translation to this Pasuk. From here we know that everything else that Rashi wrote, it's for sure true. Why? Because he wasn't embarrassed to say, I don't know. Some of us, if we don't know the answer, we'll make a nice answer, we'll convince the person, it's logical, you'll be impressed, nobody will offend your ego, but that's not the truth. One rabbi gave a lecture on Shabbat, the shul was packed with thousand people. One person got up and asked him a question. Was thinking, 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 for maybe two, three minutes, everybody's whispering. Then he said, you know, you're right. I have to close the book. 
and forget about this lecture that I gave. And he went and sat down. Right when the davening finished, everybody comes to him, Rabbi, what? You know the answer to this question. I could have answered it. I could have answered it. So the rabbi told the guy, I had five answers to give you. Five. Each one of them would convince you 100% that it's the right answer. But inside of me, I wasn't sure if it's the right answer. So for those three minutes, I was debating with myself. Should I say it or not? Because if I don't say it, everybody would say, hey, well, you're asking one question and the lecture is finished. But what's more important, my ego, my prestige, or the truth? That's the question. And I came to the conclusion the truth is above everything. With the embarrassment, I sat down and I didn't give you the five answers. And then he gave him the five answers. And the guy said, you're right. Each one of these answers is a bombastic answer. I said, but I'm not sure that that's the truth. I rather look like a fool than make something that convince you knowing maybe it's not the truth. That's a big thing. So, Mode al always admit if you argue with your friends when you learn, if you say something, it doesn't matter if he's one year in yeshiva and you are 20 years here. If you know that he said something that answers your question or contradict what you just say and he's right, you have to say, no, you're right. I was wrong, you are right. I, rem- I got a good lesson about this in my life. Many years ago when I was in yeshiva, I had a rabbi, his name was Rabbi Berkowitz. An Ashkenazi American, very nice person. And one time he gave a shiur in Masechet Shabbat, you know, when, before the Gemara begins, so you first read the Mishnah. He was reading the Mishnah, a person that made sins on Shabbat, not knowing how many sacrifices he has to bring, because it wasn't intentional. It was a few years that he did not know about Shabbat. From the time he find out, does he bring one sacrifice for all the year, or he brings per Shabbat, or per every act. It's a complicated Mishnah. So I look at the Mishnah, I see that he translates the Mishnah wrong. And I'm thinking to myself, I don't want to make myself a fool now, raising my hand and telling him, Rabbi, I think you're saying it wrong. Imagine if I'm wrong, what an embarrassment. <laughs> I better not say anything. In the end, after, the, after his shiur, I'm going to go and ask him quietly. He finishes his shiur. Now, now everything he's saying from that moment on is not correct. Because it's all based on the mistake that he made. So far I'm right. He doesn't know yet that he's teaching everything in a wrong way. Because of one line in the Mishnah, he interprets that wrong. And from that on, it's a chain reaction. Everything he said is a waste of time. And I'm dying already. When is this year going to be over? Because I'm thinking, I cannot concentrate on everything else he said. Because in my mind, I know this year is not relevant. After the show is over, it's lunch break, I come to him quietly and say, Rabbi, you say this and this and that. But here, look, it says like this. He goes like this with his glasses. I look at him, his face became in one second like a tomato. It started to sweat. He goes like this, he says, you're right, eh, you're right. He, he screamed, don't leave, don't leave, come back. He went back to the stand there. Everything I thought you was wrong. Forget about this year. I made a mistake. It just showed me my mistake. 45 years is learning and teaching, but he was humbled enough. He was a big, believe me, he's a giant, to say, Excuse me, I made a mistake. I'm sorry I wasted an hour of your time. The whole year is wrong. But do you know how many people would say, Okay, tomorrow. Tomorrow I'll correct my mistake, and tomorrow nobody would remember. Anyway, they won't remember, as long as his ego will stay up there, you know. But Hashem is testing even him. Wow, well, what do you think? You make a mistake, you have to know. And somebody told you you made a mistake, you have to admit. Then, everything we said about the wise guy, by a golem, by a fool, it's the opposite. He always break into your words. He always pretend he knows, he will never admit that he's wrong, etc., etc. All the seven things that we say. The eighth Mishnah of this Perek, seven different tragedies come to the world for seven different sins. What are they? Some people take 10% and some people do not take 10% from the wheat and the barley that they cut. You have to take 10% out to give to the Levi, to the Kohen. Some do, some don't. What comes to the world? Hunger. 
hunger, no rains, no wheat is growing, people hardly can eat. I think this Mishnah is long, I don't know if we have time to finish it. I debate, because it's going to take a long time. Well, we'll try to do it shortly, and then we'll finish with this Mishnah. Okay, so... So, because there's hunger now in the world, some people in bad economy, they still manage to eat. They still eat. Maybe they lose from their luxury, right? But uh, the plate looks the same, like today. Today we are in a recession, bad economy. Some people cannot take vacations like they, like they can. Some people couldn't send their kids to camp. Some people they cannot afford to replace their car like they used to. Fine. But food, they still bring the same grocery from the supermarket. They still have chicken and steaks and fish and everything that they used to eat, they still eat. Fruit and expensive food, no problem. But some people, it got to a point that even they cannot afford to buy bread. And I know many of them. Even bread they cannot afford. They need Tom Cheshabes to bring them boxes. If not, they finished. They don't have what to eat. They broke. They have a Mercedes, but there's no money for gas. Car is standing for two, three, five months in a, in a driveway where he cannot afford the gas and the tolls. He takes the bus now. Or the train. Why? He used to have a good job. <laughs> what can he do, you know? So, some will eat, some not. Measure for measure. Because some gave 10%, some didn't. Same thing. <coughs> then... 10% is for charity? Well, in our time, what we do, we give Maaser. It's called Maaser Ksafim. 10% from money, from salaries, from net incomes. Here we are talking about 10% from the farmers. Everybody was a farmer in some way. They all have barley and wheat and vegetables and fruit, they have to give masrot, and if they do it, fine, if not, it's a problem, okay? Then, Gamru Shalol Aser, everyone agree, we don't give 10% anymore. A big mess come to the world. Big mess to the whole world. What kind of mess? A big war. Another nation attacks them. And the people are so disturbed with the war that they cannot walk one hour in the field anymore. That's why they have to go and fight. Or even if they eat, they cannot be full. Because the person is disturbed so much, psychologically he doesn't enjoy the food, it messed up his whole system. When he goes to the bathroom, he cannot go to the bathroom, all kinds of things like that. Shaloli told the Tachala, the women do not want to make a frashat chala, or even the men. It's an, it's an obligation to take a piece from the, from the door and put it aside for the Kohen. Ra'av shel klaya bala olam. What does he mean, klaya? Klaya means a complete starvation. There's nothing to eat. Nothing whatsoever to anybody. Mamash, they're all starving. And the Gemara describes some period that they had that. Then, what else? Dever bala olam, it's a special sickness. Al mitot amorot batorah shelo nimseru lebet din. Some executions are done by the Jewish court. Mechalel Shabbat, they put to death by stoning. A murderer by a sword. A, a, a married woman that cheated on her husband by burning. Every scene, every serious scene, have a separate, different, different kind of execution. There's four different kinds of execution. What happened if a person did a scene and nobody called him? Hashem saw it. This woman cheated, she still need to be burned. Nobody saw it, but she's still the same sinner like the other one. It's no different. So what happened? What happened to that? Oh, I should be more precise. It's not that they didn't catch her. They saw her, but they closed their eyes. They pretend they didn't see. Either the witnesses or the judges. They could prosecute her, and they say, ah, you know, it's a big case now. Let's pretend we didn't see it. You know? So, because of that, Hashem brings tsunamis to the world, earthquakes. So many people died, and you don't know, hey, this guy died, this, girl, this woman died. You don't see the connection. 
But in one wave, it could be 100,000 people died, everyone who deserved execution, in one second. Earthquake, San Francisco, 10,000 gays, they died, nobody knows why. That's what's happening, what do you think? South Carolina, hurricanes, typhoons, this. Los Angeles, earthquake, places with problems with modesty always get affected the most. Voodoo, also very big problem. Worshipping idols in Haiti and in New Orleans. Remember the flood in New Orleans, what happens? The biggest tragedy. Why? Voodoo. Haiti, voodoo. Tsunami, Thailand, all the idols worshippers. Hashem bring nature massive destruction and, and, and tragedies for these people, what they do in hidden rooms. Then, Al Perot Shvi'it, people, farmers who do not keep Shnat Shmita. Every seven years you have to take a year strike. You're not allowed to plant anything, you're not allowed to cut anything, to give water to the trees, nothing. It's like you not exist. You leave your field, your orchard, everything. The poor people come, they take whatever they want to eat, but you're not allowed to produce or to do anything. They ignore that. Cherev Baal Olam. Cherev, Cherev means a sword come to the world. What kind of sword is coming to the world? Wars. Wars. The Israel is busy with wars because of that. Al Inuy Adin va Alivut Adin. What does it mean, Inuy Adin? Din is judgment. When the judges knows the verdict against a person, but maybe they're afraid to read it, or they're holding it, they're not saying it. Everybody, they know 100% what's the truth. He has to be executed, or he has to pay double, or he has to divorce his wife, or whatever the verdict is, and they're not saying it, they're holding it by them. That's one sin for the judges. Ivuta din means twist the truth. They know Reuven is right, but they go to Shimon to give him. Or al morim batora shelo ka'alacha. Rabbis or, or Dayanim or judges in a base din that they say what allowed, they say it's not allowed, or what's not allowed, they say it's allowed. No, it's allowed, it's no problem. No big deal, don't worry. Today it's allowed. All kinds of things they make up. That's those things, Hashem Yirachem, creates that Akalosh Baruch Hu goes away and re remove his spirit from us, from among us, from the nation of Israel. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu mashre shechinato al Israel until all these judges and, the, and not honest rabbis will disappear from the face of the earth. You understand? Because Hashem cannot stand uh, problems with integrity and honesty and modesty, all these things that brings all these problems to us. We finish eight Mishnayot today. And Perik uh, in, the, in the fifth chapter, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. There is a chance that in the next two lectures, yeah, well, in the next two lectures we'll finish chapter five, and then we have chapter six, and I believe another five lectures we should finish the whole series. As I said in the beginning, I, I estimated 16, 17. That's what it's going to be. So we are in the middle now of chapter uh, 5, from 6 chapters. Bezrat Hashem, next week and the following week for sure we'll finish chapter 5. Then we have chapter 6. And that's it. Thank you very much for coming. We'll see you Bezrat Hashem next Monday.